<clears throat> My name is Randall Abate, and I'm the director of the Institute for Global Understanding at Monmouth, and we are co-hosting this Global Ocean Governance Lecture Series with the Urban Coast Institute. You'll be hearing some welcoming remarks from uh, the director of the Urban Coast Institute, Tony McDonald, in a few moments. I just want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded, and we are going to be posting the recording of this session on our um, Global Ocean Governance Lecture Series uh, series page, which is available on the Urban Coast Institute website. Um, so just a couple of uh, logistics for how things will go today. This is a 75 minute session and we are going to hear from three distinguished panelists, uh, 15 minutes each. And we are going to ask that questions from the audience be submitted only through the chat feature. And then we will have Q and A for all three panelists at the conclusion of the third uh, presentation. So we, we hope to have about 20 minutes of Q and A and we uh, actively solicit your, your questions and comments. Um, so the uh, upcoming sessions, well, I'm, I'm, first of all, remind everyone that this has been a, a lecture series that we've launched this uh, academic year. We had two excellent sessions in the fall, and this is our first session in the spring, and it's the first time we're doing a three speaker panel. So we're excited about that. Uh, and we're particularly excited about the expertise that our panelists bring today and uh, especially excited to feature an all woman panel for, for this uh, an important topic. Um, so looking ahead, we have another uh, installation of this uh, series coming up in April. It's tentatively for April 8th and we'll address fisheries governance. So uh, you will be receiving information about that if you are uh, registered for this session. Um, and uh, if you're really big on advanced planning, uh, looking all the way to the fall, uh, we're planning another event in October that will address shark and whale management. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, give Tony McDonald uh, the floor, the director of the Urban Coast Institute for some uh, opening remarks. Great, thank you very much, uh, Randy. Uh, Really excited uh, to be here today. Uh, first, I want to extend my greetings to everybody and my best wishes um, during these difficult times. Um, we've learned a lot of things, I think, in this process. One is in our isolation, um, we have to also reach out and connect to people. And we've also realized that we can actually connect with people all around the globe. And I thank Randy for making these connections because I think it's very important for us to recognize that even as we're going through these difficult times, we do have an opportunity to get together and, and jointly work on issues. And this is a wonderful example. And in my mind, there's nothing like the maritime industry to really reflect that. That really is essentially the backbone. Each of our nations, each of our experiences brings something to the table. Um, we really set out in exploring the world, connecting the world, and we continue to do that through maritime commerce. So I really feel like this is a particularly uh, appropriate topic for our discussions today. Uh, we are looking how to do this. We're looking how to do this at a variety of different scales. We're looking at issues about how we all own these trust resources, and how we share them together. So I'm really excited about today's panel. I'm extremely grateful to everybody for joining us today. Uh, but a special thanks, uh, Randy and the Institute for Global Understanding for bringing together this group and hopefully what we think will be a continuing conversation to engage on issues. Um, the current administration, has committed to reconnect around the world with international partners. Uh, they can, can committed to looking at the impacts of climate. So we really do think that there is an opportunity for us to build on today's um, sharing of experiences and knowledge uh, to continue to build out those partnerships in the future. So again, thank you everybody who joined us and particularly thank you for Randy for organizing this panel today. Thank you very thank you much, very Tony, well. for those uh, Welcoming remarks. We we are grateful to have this partnership with the uh, with the Urban Coast Institute, and uh, I encourage all of you to explore the Urban Coast Institute's webpage for all the other outstanding events that that they're uh, undertaking this semester and always on uh, marine and, and coastal issues. Um, so our our panel today, as as I mentioned, is um, really exciting and is bringing together an, an ambitious uh, set of topics. So uh, merging 
marine shipping and maritime sovereignty issues is, is certainly ambitious in, in 75 minutes, but there is a, a common thread that runs through the three presentation presentations, and that is the notion of uh, these remarks are delivered against the backdrop of, of the climate change crisis and how that, that ocean and climate interface uh, is, is more relevant than ever these days. So it's, it's very exciting to bring these, these three presentations together under one roof in, in that regard, uh, hopefully in, in a way that you, you may not uh, typically see in your day-to-day your, your -day engagement on these issues. Um, so I, I'm just gonna briefly uh, refer to all three panelists now and then just kind of hand the baton over between presentations. Uh, there's detailed bios of all three speakers on our on our uh, webpage for this event, and I encourage you to to consult those and their and their abstracts. So our first speaker will will be Dr. Bea Martinez Romera, and she's a professor at the University of Copenhagen Faculty of Law in uh, Denmark, and she is an expert on many topics, uh, but one that she's very well known for, uh, among others, is uh, marine shipping governance and particularly in the uh, in the context of climate change. So we're, we're very excited to to have her kick things off uh, with with a presentation that that addresses uh, current issues in marine shipping governance and uh, the, the, the emphasis on the um, impact on on climate change. After um, her presentation, we'll, we'll next hear from uh, Dr. Samira Idbalen, and she is a professor at uh, uh, Qadi Ayad University in um, Safi, Morocco. And, and uh, like Dr. Martinez Romera, uh, Dr. Idlalin is also an expert uh, in, in these issues, uh, environmental uh, ocean governance issues, and she's gonna be delivering a, a very uh, innovative uh, look at uh, a particular aspect of um, uh, public trust principle from, um, from from Muslim law and and how that can connect to governing the marine environment and uh, in the climate change context in particular uh, a particular valuable a particularly valuable opportunity to apply those unique principles in the marine environment and then lastly we'll hear from um, Dr. Joanna Shakira and uh, she is a uh, with the University of Bergen in in Norway and. Uh, also an, an expert on um, maritime sovereignty issues and, uh, and her expertise uh, is, is in the Pacific Island Nation context and uh, the um, sovereignty issues in the, in the face of uh, sea level rise that uh, Pacific Island nations face. So all very cutting edge presentations from three ex excellent speakers. So let's start with Dr. Martinez Mare uh, Romera and her presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Um, so please let me know if you can see it. Can you? Yeah, okay, good, good. We have tested before. So uh, the first thing I would like to do is to thank uh, Randall and Tony for uh, inviting me to do this talk and congratulate them on this uh, terrific initiative that the lecture uh, series are. Um, I want to thank also my co-panelists, uh, Joanna and Samira, uh, for all the nice uh, interactions we have had in the preparation of this panel. And uh, with no further delay, um, the objective of, of my talk, because I've been told I have only and only 15 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, going to try to be really uh, strict with that. Uh, starting at 4.10, I'm counting. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview in the next 15 minutes of, of the uh, governance uh, for the regulation of, of uh, emissions from maritime transport, in particular international maritime transport. Um, so firstly, I'm going to very briefly talk about the contribution of this uh, sector uh, to the climate change problem, and then I'm going to talk to you I'm going to have framed the presentation of, of, of the governance issues in, in two kind of stages. Um, what happened in all these years from 92 to 2015 and what is happening after the, the Paris Agreement. And we're going to talk about the climate change regime. We're going to talk about the International Maritime Organization, the IMO. And we're going to talk a little bit as well about uh, the EU, what the EU is doing, um, EU action uh, on shipping. So, um, this is uh, an image, uh, it's worth a thousand words, and, and this is an image of the shipping lanes uh, that are most frequented uh, in the world. So shipping uh, accounts for around 3% uh, of uh, the global total emissions, depending on estimates that could be up to 4.5. 
Um, it is a growing source, uh, as you can see, it is estimated to, to increase from 50 to 250 percent by 2050. This uh, data is from the third uh, IMO greenhouse gas report. Uh, business as usual, I wrote here, uh, efficiency improvements that the, the sector naturally uh, has uh, will be insufficient to counterbalance this, this growth in emissions. That's why this sector needs to be tackled. So it's one of the oldest, uh, older uh, agenda items uh, in the climate change regime. And uh, when the UNFCCC uh, was adopted, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which, as you know, aims the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, the shipping sector, like any other sector of the economy, was uh, falling under the, the, the objective of the convention, under the aims of the convention. Uh, pursuing this article uh, 4.1, negotiations continue on how to incorporate the international part of shipping, the emissions that occur in the international part. And this is a very relevant distinction uh, in the climate change regime, which is uh, how domestic maritime emissions are handled and how the international maritime emissions are handled. So domestic emissions uh, under the UNFCCC parties has the obligation to, to uh, put forward inventories on their emissions and domestic emissions were needed to be reported uh, to the country, uh, to every country, including international totals, while the international part uh, of shipping uh, was uh, reported as a separate item. It was reported based on, on the country where the fuel was sold, but that was not tantamount to uh, responsibility for those emissions. So what I'm talking about, what we are focusing on where the problem lays is on the international uh, side, on the international maritime emissions. So um, international maritime uh, emissions and international aviation, they both actually are under the same category in the, in the reports of the IPCC. They call international bunker fuels, both of them, these two sectors. Uh, and, our, and the Kyoto Protocol in, in Article 2.2 excluded international maritime uh, transport emissions from the commitments of the parties. And if we read this article carefully, there's been a lot of uh, writing on it, uh, analysis on it, it says parties included in Annex 1, because uh, this is something very relevant uh, of, of the climate change regime, which has been allegedly problematic to regulate this, this sector shipping, is that uh, parties in Annex 1 means the developed countries, the countries that were listed which has most of the commitments, uh, uh, they have to uh, take the lead in addressing climate change. The UNFCCC sets this, uh, this annex system where par parties' obligations uh, or commitments are, are, are depending on, on what type of party, what the development level of the party is. And um, so, so you can see how this was targeting parties in Annex 1, and they also, uh, they said that these sectors will be excluded from the targets of the Kyoto Protocol and that the International Maritime Organization should work towards uh, regulating them. That delegation of uh, negotiation, because it was not really a, a delegation of regulation to the IMO, is uh, evident um, by the language of, artic of Article 2.2 of the Kyoto Protocol, but within the climate change regime, uh, and this is relevant, negotiations continue on how to address international maritime transport emissions uh, with the scientific um, body for, uh, the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice in terms of improving uh, inventories and also IMO was reporting progress to them. And also uh, through the long uh, ad hoc working group on long cooperative action, which was tasked following this article we pointed out, 4.1 of the UNFCCC, to find, uh, to work towards a, a, an agreement uh, in, in for long cooperative action. The work of this uh, ad hoc working group was then inherited, so to say, for by the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, which, um, uh, as you know, or you might have heard, it, it was tasked to develop uh, the Paris Agreement, so uh, another a legal instrument or an agreed outcome with legal force to be concluded by 2015. So they were they were due to negotiate and to come up with a draft to present to the COP in 2015. And within that, uh, shipping emissions, international shipping, was part of the of the text of the negotiations to see if they could include some kind of clause, uh, some kind of uh, in, the, in the Paris Agreement. So I'm going to leave things here and talk about what happened in the meantime with the IMO. So we we think about uh, the Kyoto Protocol. 
delegating the regulation, uh, sorry, the negotiation uh, of measures to address international uh, maritime transport emissions. Um, although, of course, the IMO has its own mandate that is not taking the mandate from the UNFCCC, but uh, still from 1997, uh, the issue of climate change was acknowledged in the context of the MARPOL Convention and action started at the IMO with studies, committees, working groups uh, and reporting to the climate uh, change regime as well and, and work took place basically on, on three pillars, uh, technical, operational and market-based measures. So the most important thing of what happened up, up to the Paris Agreement in 2015 is that uh, the IMO is naturally uh, naturally work with the standards and very technical uh, type of regulation. So they adopted in 2011 this energy uh, efficiency design index for new ships um, and um, an operational measure uh, and, uh, which were voluntary. Importantly, these measures, specifically the design index, uh, were adopted on equal basis because uh, the IMO, and I'm kind of, we're going to explain this a little bit better later, uh, works on equal treatment of ships. Uh, that's the, the, the primary norm that the, the IMO Convention uh, has uh, and, and treaties uh, that are uh, assigned to the IMO and the practice of the IMO. So um, a number of countries um, uh, complain or voice their opposition to such an approach. And in 2013, a technology transfer uh, agreement was made. And all that was to try to uh, improve and, and continue the discussions on market-based measures, which uh, were suspended in 2013 because of these divergent views on how to adopt a measure that could incorporate uh, differentiation for developing countries, which is a principle that operates under the climate change regime. Um, the Paris Agreement. Based on these, uh, on these problems and in the words of the, of the chairman of the MEPC, the wording of Article 2.2 uh, was very, very problematic and was the main reason why the IMO could not be able to enact a regime for shipping in a comprehensive manner. This has to do with the fact that um, with different, different issues, but uh, being probably the conflicting principles of differentiation, CBDR, RC, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, and the equal treatment of ships and the no more favorable treatment uh, of ships that work under the, the IMO regime, uh, difficult to, to, uh, to reconcile. There's also an issue of uh, conflicting object objectives. Uh, of course, the, the climate change regime is, is, is created just for the stabilization of greenhouse gases. While the IMO regime, if we look specifically to the origins, is, is meant to foster transport. Of course, the, the sustainability objective has been incorporated and, and over time they have acknowledged and they, they've been quite successful on passing environmental regulation, but it's still it's two regimes that, that, that have to reconcile different objectives as well. Uh, a third issue uh, regarding governance or, or interaction between these two regimes, climate change and the IMO, has to do with the fact that in the, in the climate change regime, market-based measures, emissions trading, is something that's quite uh, established with the Kyoto Protocol, uh, and now with the Paris Agreement still, Article 6 needs to be uh, fleshed out. But, the IMO is, is, is an organization that works on more uh, technical regulations. So these economic measures versus technical regulations is probably another reason why uh, progress was difficult up to uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, this, is, um, this is a graph about this energy efficiency design index, which was adopted in 2011. It's really the most meaningful measure that uh, was adopted for the for the sector up to that up to the Paris Agreement up to that point, and and basically what this is telling is that it was so ambitious that the business as usual uh, efficiency uh, improvements will actually deliver almost the same. So this has been reviewed now uh, in two occasions and recently uh, in 2020 as well. Going back uh, to to the Paris Agreement, what happened after the Paris Agreement? So we have this scenario before before Paris two regimes that are regulating, but not, not achieving much. And, and uh, in the interaction of these two regimes, a number of principles, uh, objectives, and, and ways to deal with, uh, with, with uh, climate change that are somehow uh, impeding progress. So what happened with Paris is that um, this clause, or this article that we talk about, that was under the negotiations on uh, shipping, international shipping, also included aviation because these two sectors, as, as I said, they kind of treated in the same, in the same box. It, it made it to the conference of the parties 
week, uh, up to Thursday, I think, but it dropped of, of the final text of the Paris Agreement. Uh, reasons are various, but you can imagine the Paris Agreement needed to reconcile many, uh, many party interests and probably shipping and aviation were not something you you will make the, the agreement dependent upon. So it was not, let's say, the, one of the main uh, things in the negotiation. So there's no mention, this, this clause, there's no mention to international maritime transport in the Paris Agreement, but that doesn't mean that the, sec the, the these emissions are excluded from the mitigation aims uh, of the agreement. However, the main mitigation tool, this is the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, they are really uh, not very well equipped to deal with uh, with international shipping so um so it, it's difficult to know what's going to happen paris is uh, a miss opportunity was a miss opportunity to clarify the, re the the relation between uh, the climate change regime and the imo and and their work principles contributing to what objective and, and with what measures uh, these these emissions could be regulated still the paris agreement uh, offers a, a system that has implications or is, is having implications on the regulation of shipping. And I put here the, the long-term goal uh, that all parties agree to, <clears throat> the issue of bottom-up approaches through the NDCs. Uh, differential treatment has been quite uh, watered down uh, and, and industry action has become uh, even more relevant. So the consequences of Paris for the regulation of emissions from international maritime transport is, on the in my view, in the first place, a forum shift from uh, the UNFCCC to the IMO. So the IMO is consolidated now, not formally, but uh, as a matter of fact, as, as the, the forum for the regulation of, uh, of shipping emissions. Um, if there was any kind of competition between, two, uh, between the two regimes, it, it is clearly here. However, it, there's nothing preventing, they are still covered by the agreement and there's nothing preventing uh, some parties uh, starting action under the UNFCCC, a working group or proposing uh, something. The second, um, the second consequence uh, that, that I see or implication of the Paris Agreement is the strengthening and increase of unilateral action because uh, for, for shipping, because uh, some uh, countries are like, let's think of the European Union, which is actually uh, including shipping in the process of including shipping under the European Emissions Trading Scheme. So some parties might decide to act uh, with these emissions and that will one either push at the international level uh, for, for more ambition that the, the European Union did already with aviation when, uh, when included aviation in the EU ETS, but also to fulfill commitments under the Paris Agreement through the NDC. So it has this double purpose of unilateral action. So what has happened at the IMO after the, um, the Paris Agreement is that um, actually the discussion on MBMs started in 2015 before the Paris Agreement with a proposal of, an, of some countries on, on, on CO2. But it was really after that in 2016 that a roadmap to adopt a strategy was launched. Uh, and and this, the initial strategy on greenhouse gas emissions uh, was adopted in 2018. The most relevant thing is that, uh, for the sake of time, is that um, it recognized that the pathway uh, of CO2 emission reductions at their IMO for international shipping should be consistent with the Paris Agreement goals. There's some measures that were incorporated in, in, in that strategy include like short-term measures, mid-term measures, and here I have highlighted market-based measures as a way to trigger technologies and then fossil, the technology pathway, moving towards a different type of fuel. As for uh, how the regulation looks, uh, what, what is happening and what is going to happen. I think there's probably two uh, main issues. Uh, one is ambition, uh, whether the IMO is going to keep uh, the ambition that it promised in line with the Paris Agreement goals. And the second is uh, what fuels are going to be developed and how the market is going to be incentivized to incorporate uh, these fuels. So the change in the, in the, in the fuels towards uh, sustainable fuels. And then the issue of uh, squaring the circle of um, uh, non-discrimination and differentiation in favor of developing countries. And already we can see in the last MEPC how some initiatives have started to recognize least developed countries uh, and island developing states, uh, special needs or circumstances. At the EU level, very, very briefly, and it's gonna be one minute and I'm done. Um, already from 2009, when, when the EU passed this directive to uh, in, in amend the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, they said in the rest of that emissions from international shipping will be included uh, around 2011. This didn't happen. Uh, but work uh, continue in the EU 
to incorporate these emissions. And uh, the outcome of that was the this monitoring, reporting, and verification uh, mechanism for maritime transport, which uh, precede a similar thing at the IMO, a, a global uh, reporting mechanism at the IMO. And that is obviously a first step towards establishing measures to address. Let's, let's see how much we emit and then what targets we choose and then how do we reduce. And in, in, this, in this context, uh, the EU Green Deal um, was uh, adopted in 2019 with a number, very various number of reasons for, for climate change. What, what we care about is that, the, and especially for shipping, is that the, the EU ETS is going to be reviewed um, and it's going to include new sectors. And this is shipping. And this is already, I think this month, actually, the uh, consultation uh, for the public uh, is closed. It's going to be closed. And, uh, and it seems uh, the, the EU is moving ahead with including shipping emissions in a way that might also affect uh, international shipping. So, okay, that was 17 minutes, not 15. I'm sorry for that. And thank you so much. If you, that was a very, very fast overview. But if, if you have any questions, please, uh, later in the Q&A, but also feel free to, um, to send me an email. Thank you so much for that informative presentation, Bea. Um, you've reminded us that you can indeed cover a lot of ground in 15 minutes. And uh, uh, marine shipping has always been a bit of a blind spot in my expertise in uh, in marine uh, law and policy. So I'm grateful for all the wisdom you imparted in that short uh, period of time. Uh, next up in our distinguished panel is Dr. Samira Edlalen, and uh, she's going to be talking about a, a very cutting edge and, and interesting topic that I will leave entirely to her to, to share with you. Samira, the floor is yours. Samira, you're on mute. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Can you hear can, me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry. I have an issue with my, with my, um, oh, voila. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Randall, and thank you, Tony, for inviting me to participate to this uh, panel. Uh, as you just uh, heard with the, the presentation, very instructive presentation of BS presentation, actually, marine environmental law is uh, basically uh, a very technical aspect, uh, very technical branch of law. Uh, however, the bottom line, finally, of uh, any environmental law still um, is actually the ethics, what all uh, environmental uh, statutes all over the world are sharing is finally the, the ethics uh, or the environmental ethics. Uh, in my presentation, I will be uh, talking about uh, the atmospheric work principle, which is actually uh, belonging to the Sharia, uh, and uh, normally, uh, as uh, um, uh, come on, uh, it's it's it can sound somehow strange to talk about Sharia in a panel dedicated to marine environmental law. However, as you will see, there there are connections actually between uh, marine environmental law and climate uh, change and climate law. With, with the Sharia. I came myself from a marine environmental background and I, 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 I was le led to, to uh, study Sharia because of, of um, what I will explain later. Actually, I will talk about these three uh, points. First of all, what are the connections between marine environmental law and the Sharia, or what I call the atmospheric work principle. Secondly, what is the atmospheric work principle? And third, what, uh, um, how and why and how we can apply this principle in Muslim countries. So as I told you, I, I was first studying uh, marine environment law, especially coastal law. And uh, I came, uh, I was studying what uh, we call in France, the Conservatoire du Littoral, created in 1975. 
and it is owning actually 50% uh, of coastal zone in France. Uh, however, um, this, uh, this uh, institution is actually inspired from another institution in England called the National Trust. Its uh, full name is, um, it has a nice name actually, National Trust for Places of Historic Interest or Natural Beauty. It was created in 1895 and it is only now 10% uh, of coastal zone in order to conserve these, these areas. Uh, I discovered later that actually the National Trust is based on the idea or the institution uh, or legal principle of the trust, which has actually the same uh, function in mode uh, as another institution exi which exists within uh, Islamic law called the Waqf. Actually, Waqf is uh, an ancestral institution uh, however, it has uh, somehow fallen into disuse for ecological purposes. It still exists today, but it is used mostly for creating mo uh, mosques or, or building uh, sometimes schools. Actually, the first uh, uh, university in the world, uh, in the Muslim world at least, uh, was created uh, on the basis of Waqf, which is the trust. Uh, so this, uh, um, the idea of uh, the atmospheric work principle is actually starting from, from the trust or the waqf. It is actually the same institution. Uh, both waqf and trust are based on three components, which are the donor and the, the trustee who is managing the trust asset and beneficiaries. Beneficiaries can be the whole community because trusts as the Waqf are charitable institutions, uh, basically. And uh, the beneficiaries can be also uh, family members, uh, or even they can be the unborn, uh, uh, unborn uh, people. And they also can be animals, which is, uh, I think, revolutionary within the, the law. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I should men mention that Islam encompasses both religion and law. It, it is not only uh, spirituality, but it also it is also law. Which uh, uh, in every Muslim countries they have, we have what we call the Islamic supremacy clause, which means that the whole legal system should uh, respect uh, or be compatible with this rule. Uh, Waqf is, as the trust, is actually at the core of Muslim civilization. Uh, uh, the trust is also at the core of the common law. Waqf is a Sharia flexible tool. It can be used for uh, many different purposes, just as the trust can do the same. Uh, I argue for this, uh, this, um, this um, principle, the atmospheric principle, uh, work principle that uh, the Muslim Muslim countries need to go further and apply what uh, one judge in India in um, uh, called the trust in the higher sense. Actually, we need to uh, apply uh, a wider idea of the based on 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 the principle of waqf. Uh, I will explain that later. Um, and we should make actually in Muslim world, uh, in Muslim countries, we should make a revival of the ecological waqf because uh, this is what I will talk about late uh, now. But uh, as I don't have time, uh, maybe I will just jump to the how uh, because I think it's more important. Uh, why uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, all uh, Muslim countries have. Uh, environmental problems and that the environmental rule of law is not applied. So I will just jump to here and maybe I should just mention uh, that actually the ecological work uh, existed within uh, Muslim countries. Here you have the two pictures, one of the stork house uh, in Marrakesh. It is a house uh, built uh, on the basis of the work and it is dedicated to, uh, sh it, it was a shelter for, for birds. Uh, the same thing you can um, see here in the picture of the birdhouse in Turkey. 
It is also used uh, as a, a waqf, which means there is a donor who put his this uh, place for the benefit of animals. Uh, alors, maintenant, uh, how or, or how we can apply the atmospheric uh, waqf principle in Muslim countries? There are at least three reasons. The first one is the growing uh, uh, of, of the Islamic finance all over the world and not only in, in Muslim countries. Uh, secondly, the spiritual uh, ecological movement, what we call in Muslim countries eco-Islam. And third, the revolution of the principle of the trust within the common law. So I will start with the finance, uh, the Islamic finance, as you know, it is gaining momentum all over the world. Uh, what is interesting here is that one of the countries who is the first who is applying the Islamic finance in the, in the world, Malaysia, is also a, a country who is using Sharia for ecological purposes through what the, it is called the green fatwas. I will talk about that later. Um, in Kuwait, for example, they have used the waqf, which, is, which can be used actually uh, as a funding mechanism. They have used it uh, in order to fund the enforcement of the Regional Convention for Cooperation on the Protection of the Marine Environment uh, from Pollution. Uh, and uh, uh, also we find the usage of Islamic finance in Indonesia through what they call the fishing boat waqf. Uh, so we uh, Muslim countries need to tap into this expansion of Islamic finance in order to green this path of 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 this uh, of Islamic finance. Um, we can actually use Islamic finance for, for example, as a tool for funding the creation of protected areas. We can use it as a tool for uh, fund cleanups or uh, any other uh, ecological purposes. Uh, the second enabling framework for the, the, uh, the uh, atmospheric uh, uh, trust or atmospheric waqf principle is the spiritual ecological movement. Uh, it's, uh, in, in Muslim countries, there is a seminal work done by uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr, who is an Iranian uh, scholar, uh, his book written in 68, uh, Man and Nature, is now used uh, by uh, the movement Eco Islam, which is uh, a grassroots movement in, uh, in many Islamic countries, especially in Muslim countries, especially in Asian Muslim countries. And uh, this book was followed by uh, many other uh, initiatives, uh, for example, uh, in the framework of the IUCN, the Environment Protection in Islam report, done in the 18s and uh, uh, re-edited in 1994. The IFIS uh, is a very important NGO created in England and it is um, the Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences, and it has developed programs uh, in order to uh, apply the eco Islam or the spiritual ecological movement. Uh, it, uh, it collaborated with uh, the ARC, which is the Alliance for Religion and Conservation, and they have uh, um, initiated uh, programs in order to teach fishermen uh, the uh, spirituality or the Islamic teaching of uh, how they can protect the environment because actually they were um, uh, using dynamics for fishing. It was in Zanzibar, Tanzania. It is a very famous example. And uh, they, uh, this teaching from Ifis and ARC have changed their behavior because, they, uh, because of the powerful uh, message uh, given by uh, people who are uh, like, for example, uh, ulama, um, who are uh, uh, Islamic or Muslim scholars. This movement brought about the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, which was presented to the negotiators of the, uh, of the COP, um, of uh, the Paris Agreement. 
And uh, of course, you know that Lauda to see has participated uh, also to this uh, uh, great movement. It is not only uh, limited to Muslim uh, countries, but it is a wide world movement. And the outcome of this movement is the recent initiative uh, by the UNEP, which is called the Faith for Earth Initiative. And uh, this initiative actually is um, is uh, encouraging and supporting NGOs uh, in order to apply the SDGs, especially faith-based NGOs. Uh, this is the second, uh, second enabling framework for the revival or the application of the new paradigm, uh, which is called uh, the atmospheric uh, uh, work principle. The third enabling framework is, uh, as you know, the trust principle within the common law, and you know that the trust has uh, known an extraordinary uh, evolution within the common law. First, it was uh, an instrument just as the waqf is. It was a basic, a traditional trust uh, with the three components, uh, the trustee, the donor, the trustee who is managing the trust and beneficiaries. And after that, it has evolved uh, in uh, within the public trust doctrine. Uh, which is a, um, a doctrine that uh, um, considers that the government uh, is um, uh, responsible or is a trustee for uh, natural resources, resources for the benefit of the population. And this uh, public trust doctrine was first applied only to res commune, uh, which is shoreline and river, uh, rivers. And the, um, the seminal work by the uh, Joseph Sachs in 1970 uh, have, has made a shift uh, within the public trust doctrine, which is not uh, uh, applied only to uh, the public trust, res commune, but also to the whole uh, natural resources. Uh, another shift or another evolution within this concept is uh, uh, the work done by uh, Marie Christine Aoud, Nature's Trust, in which she considers that the trust should be, uh, or uh, uh, I, I mean, the public trust should be extended also to the air and atmosphere. So, and this evolution brought about the movement uh, that you all now uh, called the. Uh, Mm, the atmospheric trust litigation. And uh, I think uh, Muslim countries need also to make a revival of the idea of trust that exists within Muslim law. And uh, they need, uh, as uh, I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, Professor Joseph Sachs, we also need to liberate the work from its historical shackles uh, so that we Ma we will also in uh, Muslim countries have this uh, idea of the trust in the higher sense. Uh, yes, here I have just uh, um, uh, a comparison between the trust and waqf. Actually, trust and waqf uh, are also dedicated in perpetuity, uh, which means they have this sustainable aspect within them. And they can be dedicated to nature. Uh, what is uh, really revolutionary within uh, trust in Muslim in, 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 in Sharia is that it can be dedicated to animals, which means that animals are have rights. Are uh, and if we, it's somehow I think uh, a recognition of a personhood for animals, which is just revolutionary. However, this aspect was not really uh, deepened or explored by, by scholars uh, right now. I am talking about this in, in my uh, uh, upcoming book. I will put a reference to it. Uh, so finally, there are common grounds between the trusts uh, in Muslim countries and in common law. And we need, here I am quoting you, uh, uh, Rendal, as you said, the, uh, the environmental justice movement have served as a platform for, uh, for the revival, for, uh, for, for the atmospheric uh, uh, trust uh, litigation. Uh, I think that also uh, the eco-Islam movement, which is really 
uh, expanding, uh, especially in Asian countries. Uh, this movement can also serve as a platform for the expansion of the uh, atmospheric waqf principle. Uh, uh, here, just uh, uh, um, uh, fastly a reference for uh, the last uh, report released by uh, the UNEP and Sabin Center for Climate Change, in which they are uh, putting statistics on cases, on climate change cases. They are not based on the principle of the trust. However, what we can see is that there are few uh, Muslim countries who participated to the climate change litigation, uh, especially Pakistan. And Pakistan did not mention any uh, principle from Islamic law, even if this exists within the, the, their legal system as in, in, in other Muslim countries. Uh, here are some uh, pre, um, uh, examples of how uh, uh, the uh, atmospheric waqf principle is actually uh, in preparation somehow because we find it in the amicus curia briefs presented even in the United States in the case in Juliana case for example uh, they have uh, uh, used in the amicus curia brief uh, the declaration, uh, the Islamic declaration on global climate change as an argument. And uh, as uh, Martin Palmer said, uh, I am quoting he him here, the climate change is not the issue, the issue is human behavior. And here you can see uh, many uh, initiatives that have uh, been undertaken in order to uh, pave the way for the creation of this new uh, paradigm. Uh, finally, to, to put uh, a uh, transition with my presentation and Joanna's presentation, I will quote from these fishermen who have benefited from the program uh, initiated by IFIS, the uh, Islamic uh, uh, Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences. He said it's easy to ignore the government, uh, and it was actually in Zanzibar, Tanzania. It's an island. That's how I said it's the transition. It's easy to ignore the government, but no one can break the law of God. Uh, that means that the teachings, uh, spiritual teachings, uh, were um, uh, made a paradigm shift uh, within, uh, or at least a, a, a shift in the behavior of these fishermen. And we need also to reframe environmental law in Muslim countries within this uh, principle. Uh, finally, you see here the, um, um, the book, which will be released, uh, published so in, uh, in 31, first, 31st uh, March, uh, in which I'm explaining in length uh, all I just said in my presentation. And uh, thank you. I hope I was... Uh, I hope I was not too long. Thank you so much, Samira, for that very informative presentation, uh, and <clears throat> and thank you for for citing to me in it. That's that that's an honor, and I'm certainly looking forward to citing you in your fantastic upcoming book. Uh, that's going to take a deeper dive into all of these fascinating uh, principles you've brought to our attention. As you know, I'm interested in. Uh, in animal law and, and a lot of what you've conveyed really shows a lot of promise for uh, protecting the, the voiceless, as I call them, uh, animals, natural resources, future generations. And I think there's particular opportunity here for protecting marine um, marine critters as, as, as it were uh, through your theory. So I, I really look forward to learning more about this. Uh, our third and final speaker is uh, Dr. Joanna Shakara and, uh, and uh, Samira set that uh, transition nicely uh, in that uh, Dr. Shakara will be sharing with us uh, a focus on uh, Pacific Island nations and the challenges that they face uh, with respect to maritime sovereignty in the climate change context and sea level rise. The floor is yours, Joanna. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Randall Abate, uh, for organizing this uh, event. Thank you, my uh, fellow uh, panelists. Uh, ladies, I have already learned a lot from you. And last but not least, uh, 
I am honored to see among participants Professor Edward Feeding, who is uh, my principal uh, investigation, uh, investigator of the project. So he's the reason why I'm here in Norway. So it's a privilege. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as it was, uh, I was introduced at the beginning, um, I, uh, I've written a doctoral thesis on Pacific regionalism. So my comments will be largely based on the ocean change uh, consequences towards the Pacific island countries and territories. Uh, but I will use this as an example to portray the legal dilemma of maritime sovereignty, the question of statehood, a legal personality of entities. Uh, I'm using exactly entities, not states, because uh, as you are all aware, uh, there are some um, criteria to, to call an entity as a state. Uh, so entities uh, with shrinking territory or without it. Here I mean the course of disappearance through uh, inundation, but even though um, there won't be um, the full and permanent inundation, so a state uh, being an island or a group of islands would be submerged, we still have to be aware of other equally severe connotations of ocean change um, towards island states like those in Oceania or Delta X states like Bangladesh or low laying states. Uh, here I mean mostly coastal states. Mm. Here I'm holding a paper being uh, not legally binding though, rather like informative document, um, which was uh, issued um, exactly last year um, by the International Law Commission at the United Nations. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, this document, not even being legally binded, was, um, is touching upon legal consequences of sea level rise for the first time officially. And we all know that this problem, it's not a new problem. It's been uh, happening since some decades. But for the first time, uh, countries decided to sit down and to issue a paper, which is still like a brochure. It is only, and I will quote, the presented paper does not intend to take any position concerning the status of any of offshore, meaning um, islands and its legal definition uh, of offshore features, but only seeks to examine existing state practice. And here, is my perception that I would like to use existing international law, principles of public international uh, law, the doctrine, um, to, to analyze this, uh, this um, problem, this legal dilemma. Um, so the aim uh, of all states in general is to secure international peace and security. Um, how? Through securing stability. Uh, here, uh, I, I can tell you that I've just uh, finished a long week uh, course from NATO, so we've been talking about uh, uh, yeah, securing stability. And here we have to analyze this uh, um, problem of ocean change from this perspective, because um, every state has to protect the statehood, so the legal um, personality that includes uh, rights and duties of the state on international arena. Uh, and here I have the Bible uh, of uh, the Law of the Sea being um, United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea from 1982, uh, which is the aim is to secure, to protect this uh, stability, international um, peace and security uh, when it comes to the um, law of uh, the sea, because otherwise that will open um, the field for many neighborhood uh, conflicts between states uh, regarding the maritime territory. And actually, I can tell you that uh, during the pandemic, that was exactly the breakout uh, last year, March, I was on my scholarship in uh, Paris. Um, uh, in um, that was the Institut de Relations Internationales et Stratégiques, and I spoke to French ambassador of the oceans, and what he said um, that France shall not open this legal dilemma of shrinking islands. I will just remind you that uh, France is the second largest uh, maritime um, force, of course, after the United States of America. 
uh, and France shall not do that due to French, um, due to the, well, diplomatical connotations and highly probable and well expected effect of so called Pandora box. Um, so uh, we have to, again, bear in mind that, uh, um, well, I have also agree in public policy. So I have to underline that law itself um, can serve as a tool, but not the, resolu not the resolution uh, for um, political problems. So we might use the legal um, principles, the, the legal uh, values, uh, among states, but we cannot only say that we have law and that will solve the problem because this is not the case. And uh, here I will only remind one of the public international law principles that is acting with good faith. And uh, again, what should not be surprised in this um, um, International Law Commission um, report, because yeah, this is report. So there are two groups of states, so it's, it's very clear to divide two groups of states, of course, the vast majority opt, uh, opts for status quo, to keep the existing law of the sea, not to change it, not to put any um, changes, annexations, uh, whatever, because that will, again, threat the stability and security. States don't want that, but then again, who are those states who are saying that? Those who are not directly affected by sea level rise, by acidification of the ocean, by warming up of the sea and all of those processes. I'm a lawyer, so I will not go into uh, you know, biological uh, things, but in a sense, they affect directly on human security, state security, food security, because all of those processes, they affect uh, food chains. Uh, also in the Pacific, uh, as I deal with it uh, in the project here in, in Norway. But um, then again, the smallest group of countries, which are, again, directly affected by the sea uh, level rise and other ocean change consequences, they want to change the law. They want to adapt uh, the, the existing binding legal norms uh, in order to help them to survive to keep their statehood, to keep they, their um, legal personality, so they could uh, keep the rights and duties of independent sovereign states on international arena. Uh, here I will uh, recall the 2014 Permanent Court of Arbitration judgment in the case of Bangladesh versus India on Bay of Bengal maritime boundary arbitration. Quote, uh, maritime boundaries, just like land boundaries, must be stable and definitive to ensure a peaceful relationship between states in the long term. Uh, again, to keep it safe, to keep, uh, not to cause any potential political or yeah, stability threats. Uh, and here, from this uh, judgment, we can bring opinio juris, how to interpret, how to analyze other uh, issues like dilemma around exclusive economic zones. Um, should we uh, keep them as they are? How should we um, calculate uh, the maritime boundaries? Again, uh, from, from this opinion, Yuris, from this judgment, we can uh, understand that uh, we can keep as they are, so not ambulatory, how other um, of uh, international lawyers would uh, interpret um, uh, UNCLOS, United Nations Convention of the Sea. No, that is a mistake in legal interpretation because expressis verbis, so yeah, directly, clearly how it was, uh, the ambulatory bind, uh, boundaries um, were uh, in relation only uh, to deltaic, uh, to deltas, uh, right? Um, uh, so, so this is the thing that, uh, uh, yes, yeah, or delta lake states, but also natural conditions. So not intentionally erected artificial islands, like some countries, I will not name them, were trying to do. Um, so, um, and again, uh, we, we might, uh, how we can, uh, by using uh, international law, uh, address this problem. We might 
uh, codify customary law or we can um, have some progressive development of existing hard law. Uh, as you can see, um, to, to change uh, uh, international law, we would have to have, well, majority or preferably uh, agreement uh, at the uh, global uh, level, which we, are, we already know that states are not willing to do so. They don't want to get any more burdens on themselves. They have clearly stated in the report that they shall not do that. So uh, if this is not the case of changing UNCLOS, what can we do? And here um, I have some political declarations uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum. This is an international organization, um, regional organization from the Pacific established in 1971, um, which uh, this, this organization has suggested regional practice and this is what, uh, what is uh, actually, in my opinion, and not only mine, but uh, the very good solution, because we will not push other countries who are not willing to contribute in building this international law now or in the future, but we solve the problem at the regional level. I will just remind that um, Montevideo Convention from 1933 on the rights and duties of states that was the same idea. The, the first idea was to codify this issue, what is a state after the process of the, 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 the oh, sorry, the colonization uh, in South America, right? So that was strictly regional, only binding for the states. But after some years, it became a custom, a customary law. And now in doctrine, everyone around the world will quote Article 1 of Montevideo Convention, even though that it was first made as a regional solution on the regional problem. So here, uh, I will just only say that um, this is a good regional practice that, um, and I will quote one of the um, yeah, uh, political declaration of uh, PIF, that once the maritime boundaries are delineated, which means uh, deposited, those zones would not be challenged or reduced as a result of sea level rise and ocean change. So states will keep their territory because they are strongly dependent on the maritime environment. This is their identity. This is uh, where do they come from, what uh, shape their um, approach. Uh, towards uh, each other, so internal and external um, relations, and this is what they can offer uh, to, to other regions. Um, yes, uh, I think I will stop here because I'm, I'm very passionate about this topic, but uh, I am curious uh, about the audience and uh, the questions. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Donna, for that excellent presentation um, and uh, some, some really interesting observations that I hadn't thought about. And I've certainly done a lot of work in this area on uh, uh, sea level rise adaptation in the Pacific as well and climate displacement. So we've, we've had quite a range of uh, topics covered in, in these three excellent presentations. Um, I've, I've tried to prime the audience a bit with inserting some questions uh, into the chat as as we progressed. I, I don't see other questions uh, in the chat at the moment. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll just pose one question at a time until I see questions coming from the chat. So for, uh, for Bea, I uh, put a question in that uh, just struck me as um, some idle curiosity that might be relevant to the audience's interest. And that is this necessary transition to sustainable fuels that, that we see across all sectors. Um, do you have a sense on, on who's making better progress in that direction, uh, the aviation industry or the, uh, the, the mar uh, marine shipping industry? So um, something that I haven't talked about is that aviation, uh, inter emissions from international aviation at, at ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, they've been faster than the IMO in regulating. So they are a bit like two steps before the IMO. 
Um, so um, Akio has this um, Corsia, passed this Corsia and offsetting mechanism for the sector. And there are certain things that the IMO is trying to mirror or look at what they've done for this global sector. What can we learn from that? And actually it was not very far away that, so um, just all that to say that aviation is more advanced on sustainable uh, aviation fuels and they have a strategy and whatever. And there's a number of lessons that recently have been highlighted in a report by the um, Environment Defense Fund. Uh, I don't have the name of the report. I will try to find it and put it on the chat. Um, where they say, how can the IMO look into what type of regulation uh, I, I, the IKEA is, is putting for sustainable fuels or including um, life cycle, uh, including what, global warming potential and not only uh, CO2. So that type of thing, what can they learn from the system? that is So aviation is like a step ahead if, uh, <laughs> yeah. With more challenges because it's not like a, there's a matter of weight and space that they have to sort out when they fly. No, so it's, it's a bit different. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so, so that my questions don't monopolize the uh, the Q and A. I saw one come in for Joanna, uh, and the question was. Um, uh, can you comment on the International Law Association work on sea level rise? Sea level rise. I, I was just wondering if that's a new, some kind of acronym uh, after an eight, of course, uh, I have many acronyms in my head. Sorry. Um, what is my comment? Of course, it is good to work on it, but still that the paper was issued last year and that was only, um, you know, um, like a coverage of states um, idea how not even how to tackle the problem and this is the thing we are still talking um, about uh, perception of each uh, particular state not the legal uh, resolutions not the legal solutions on that not any suggestions how to tackle the problem uh, and uh, I think uh, that's all um, you know uh, leads us to politics international relations uh, what states will lose potentially if they will bring up on the negotiation table this um, issue because and again some some states are deeply concerned because they are directly affected some are not some have other problems or international uh, issues thus uh, again I, I think um, it uh, the, the 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 efficient way, way uh, to solve this uh, is the regional way of, of doing things, unfortunately. But uh, as I spoke to some yeah, diplomats, uh, I, I, can, I can see that uh, um, everyone is officially pro. Yes, we want to protect the, the environment uh, and people, uh, especially on island states. But of course we have to have in mind money that those countries, they are, um, very poor. They are uh, developing countries. They don't have, uh, um, you know, infrastructure or industry. Uh, so, um, like, probably what I'm saying, it's not politically correct, but this is the reason why it has not been legally solved uh, ever since. Johanna. Thank you, Johanna, for that. Uh... That insight. And uh, we, we have a more general question, which I believe is open to all three panelists um, and certainly something relevant to us all. Uh, do you believe that the short term evidence of positive environmental changes observed during the uh, global COVID-19 shutdown will be helpful in arguments for further regulation? Or do you expect countries to simply return to business as usual? Um, this is something that I've, I've done a lot of uh, thinking and, and writing about just in the past year. Um, so I'll, I'll reserve my comments. I'm interested to hear from uh, the panelists on this. Um, well, I think um, everyone is looking towards the, the, the green recovery. No? Uh, when we recover from this COVID situation that the, the investments are put in the right place so as to promote uh, green industry, green, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, there's also, I mean, I guess for aviation, there's a, it's going to be a, a huge um, a remodelation or re, you know, reorganization of the industry. Many airlines have suffered a lot. Uh, so uh, probably some changes are to be seen there because at some point it was like, 
flying was extremely, let's just say that the price of a flight uh, within short distance uh, in Europe, for example, with certain companies, I don't think it was properly reflecting the environmental cost. So I think probably that those things are going to have some kind of uh, change. Samira or Johanna, anything to add to that? Uh, that was very optimistic. Uh, unfortunately, I do not share that opinion. I think it's always business as usual, especially as we are not touched with that. So um, also with this International Law Commission, I know that they will issue another paper this year, which would be equally irrelevant, meaning not legally binding. And um, yes, unfortunately. Okay, so we've got another question that goes to um, Bea's presentation. Um, considering that 80% of all international trade is moved by maritime industry, and this is likely to increase, to what extent is, if any, is IMO maritime industry promoting or facilitating the development of non-GHG fuels for the maritime industry? Yeah, so I think this uh, we can I can take together with the previous one, which is the plans to scale uh, methanol uh, for for shipping. Uh, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not I don't know the technicalities of the thing. But um, what uh, what I, what I hear is that what, what I see, and it's something that we we also see in in theory uh, of law and, and policy and governance, is the, this climate collapse uh, approach to things. So it's probably there's going to be certain uh, players uh, that are going to want to move faster towards adopting that. But I think a big issue is uh, first, that the, these fuels become um, economically viable and available. Uh, and, and that is kind of a um, uh, catch-22 situation. So how do you incentivize the market uh, to make this available? And, and so it, I think the industry probably knows that they need to move towards uh, fuels that are uh, consistent with that deep decarbonization process. They, they, I think it's more about when they're doing it and what incentives are there to facilitate uh, the, the market to facilitate this to be real. So I don't think, I think technically, uh, for what I understand from it is possible, it's more a matter of uh, creating a market for it. Um, and in that, the, of course, regulation has, a, the law has a big role to play in terms of ambition, making, you know, um, to make the system work, to trigger the technology, to incorporate that. Um, yeah, and I, uh, there was also a question before that I would like to answer if that's okay with you, Randall. Sure. Because uh, it was also directed to me, I think it was from Tony, it was about uh, NDCs. Uh, there's a discussion on incorporating international shipping uh, emissions, allocating them to specific countries. And I want to answer that because maybe it was not clear when I uh, present, but uh, already at the very beginning of the, of the climate change regime, it was not possible to allocate these emissions to specific countries because of the uh, nature uh, of the business itself. How do you say who is to pay for these emissions? The country that is importing the goods, the ship owner, the charter. So it's, it's, it was very difficult to agree on that. So it is only the um, uh, the domestic part that falls under the country's uh, obligations, let's say, and that uh, could be reflected in domestic measures. Now the NDCs, which are reflecting these domestic reductions, could incorporate international emissions as well, like was the case with the EU ETS for aviation, because the measure itself, the inclusion of aviation in the EU ETS, and you can think of something similar for shipping, uh, was every single flight arriving and departing from the EU was covered by the scheme, which means also international flights and international parts and emissions happening over the territory of other jurisdictions of other states were covered for, you know, you seen the same principle could apply for port state jurisdiction. If you decide to go to a port, you basically comply with whatever rules are there. So it is possible for countries, and that's what I, to incorporate that in the NDCs, but the NDCs are not, uh, are thought or are suited better for like domestic, uh, for national policies. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much, Bea. And we're um, running out of time here. I, I did want to have one question to, uh, addressed to uh, Samira's presentation before we conclude. And and it was the, uh, the ecological walk uh, principle appears to be broader than U.S. public trust and offers great promise for protection of the marine environment. Um, and I'm curious, what obstacles do you anticipate in seeking to apply that principle to the marine environment, Samira? 
Yes, thank you, Randall. Yeah, exactly. Actually, the uh, atmospheric work principle, uh, it, it does not uh, really exist. I mean, it's uh, an idea, it's an ideal, actually, because uh, uh, what we have now in uh, Muslim countries, we have only the traditional uh, trust. We did not uh, made the evolution towards the uh, atmospheric uh, trust uh, or work principle. Uh, it, it is actually an, um, something I'm arguing for because uh, we have all the ingredients for it within uh, many Muslim countries. We have uh, this grand norm called the uh, uh, Islamic supremacy clause within uh, the constitutions in these countries. And uh, we have uh, statute, uh, statutes on, on waqf also in Muslim countries. Uh, however, we need to make this uh, paradigm uh, shift towards the idea of, of the atmospheric uh, trust or atmospheric waqf. Uh, why? Because of the many reasons you already know. Uh, statutory law based on the Western legal model is not uh, enforced. And also because uh, Muslim countries, uh, we can are divided into two categories. They, they, we have uh, uh, very rich uh, uh, Muslim countries using uh, in their economy uh, fossil fuel uh, like uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, etc. And on the other sa side, we have uh, countries uh, who are poor countries and uh, with all uh, the issues, environmental issues like drought, marine pollution, uh, etc. Uh, so it, it is something we need to do because we have all the ingredients within the, the legal system uh, in these countries. Thank you, Samira. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation. There are still several questions that didn't uh, get addressed yet, but uh, uh, those who have to leave certainly can, can drop off as you need to. Um, but one, one question to the entire panel um, was uh, how much of a role of, uh, do you see for litigation, national or international, against governments or corporations? Um. I uh, mentioned this Pandora box uh, phenomenon that uh, if uh, you know, one of, of the state will allow in um, you know, like its uh, national uh, legal order on, on doing such uh, litigation, even though we, we can observe that it has been uh, going. It, uh, we had some um, first uh, uh, court decisions or, or first um, you know, touching base <laughs> of this. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think uh, what, I, what I can see from not only my legal point of view, but political, that uh, states uh, will be against that because uh, mm, here again we, we miss obligatory um, like international <laughs> judiciary. So uh, how can we like organize, the, I don't know, ad hoc uh, tribunal of uh, you know, environmental protection, even though that would be awesome, that would solve many uh, legal problems, but we cannot uh, put uh, a state or a, uh, or a corporation or mm, like to the court, right? So from the systemic point of view, at this moment, it is impossible. I'm not saying that uh, uh, it will not be like ever possible because we have non-state actors who are gaining more and more um, power. Uh, so uh, we can observe that uh, like in the future, the, the system of international law or perhaps international governance will change. So uh, I'm not sure like how much can we go, right? So until which level, how bad should it be? Like for example, to submerge some states like literally to, to cover you know by the level of water one particular state so the other states would you know wake up and see wow we have a problem because for now everyone is saying yes i'm submerging they are losing territory but some uh, you know meters only so why should we bother and uh, wake up the whole um international community so again i'm, I'm thinking like practically um I don't know if that answers your, your question, but, no. but... Thank you, John, and that's very helpful. And I think that's certainly the, the 
the landscape for the international litigation uh, context, but certainly domestically um, uh, against corporations, that, that has certainly been a focus in the US of late, uh, some very significant uh, common law cases against corporation for contribution to global climate change and adaptation costs that uh, state and uh, local governmental entities are facing. Um, Bea, you had a comment on this question? No, I just was going to say that the same thing as you, that there's a, there's a role to play by litigation, especially in the with the lack of action. So it's one of, and besides the legal uh, purpose that it might fulfill, it also fulfills um, an, uh, an awareness purpose for society. Uh, it puts pressure. So it's not only about the legal developments that m might come. It also plays a role, I think, in uh, giving judges more knowledge uh, and more basis for the next case. So it's a building a stepping stone type of thing. So there's a huge role for it. Um, and, and you can see that, as you say, in the, in the US in particular, and from the first case um, in 1994, that considers somehow climate change to the whatever, over 1,300 cases that are somehow dealing also with climate change. So it's, it's a huge role for climate change litigation, both at the government and the, and the corporation level. Okay, so I know Zoom fatigue is real for all of us. I wanna close with this last question. Um, do you anticipate economic sanctions and trade agreements playing a larger role in the future of environmental and marine regulation in place of formal international regulation or litigation? So, um, <laughs> um, Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, what comes to mind is that uh, can, to my mind is that countries or regions that are more ambitious with certain with establishing um, climate measures uh, might start pursuing some kind of border tax, uh, carbon tax adjustment. Uh, and that is uh, to say of the European Union, for example, how that will play in the entire uh, trade system and what disputes will arise from that, that, that I'm not uh, entirely sure that remain to be seen. But uh, yeah, I think it still is, um, uh, you cannot uh, completely um, ignore that we live in a global world and goods will come and go. So you need to do something if you really heavily put in restrictions in your own industry. So yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that's a good place for us to conclude this excellent panel session. Thank you all for attending and for your thoughtful comments and questions. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, this will be recorded. Uh, for those of you who joined late or if you have colleagues who, who wanted to attend and were not able to join us, um, the, uh, the series webpage is in the chat. So uh, I, I look forward to seeing you at our next session, which uh, tentatively is scheduled for April 8th and will focus on fisheries governance issues. Uh, and um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, Tony, did you wanna say anything before we wrap up? I just put a little note on the chat. I have to boot up my next Zoom, but really this was really a wonderful conversation and it's great to make these connections personally, professionally and uh, Really, I think there's a lot of aspirations that were set out for us to continue uh, to think about how we can build on these ideas. So uh, again, thank you, Randy, for pulling it together. And it's great to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, Randy, uh, uh, Randy, sorry. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. I <laughs> oh, so Mary, you're. Terrible Frozen. connection. <laughs> <laughs> Better now than 20 minutes oh, ago. <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. But it was Thank pleasant. you, Bye-bye. Really, you did a really good job, guys. Really. Thank you. Thank Ciao. you, Jonna. Samir, I think we can hear you now, maybe. Yes, uh, oh. because uh, to add that. Can you hear me? <laughs> now, yes. Yes. Yeah, I just so now we can't. <laughs> Bye, Bea. Okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But, uh, can you hear me? Now we can speak quickly. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to thank my. 
my we friends who are in the in the panel, like Professor John Bonain and Professor Ma Ali Muhammad Ali and all, and also my students, Rita Shehbuni. Voila, this is all, and thank you for for inviting me again. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. John, it's great to see you as well. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you too, Randall. Great, great panel. Thank you. Samira, we'll go to Messenger now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wrap things up now. Great.